space is open to us now, and our eagerness to share its meaning is not governed by the efforts of others. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. We propose to accelerate the development of the appropriate lunar spacecraft. We propose to develop alternate liquid and solid fuel boosters, much larger than any now being developed, until certain which is superior. We propose additional funds for other engine development, and for unmanned exploration, explorations which are particularly important for one purpose which this nation will never overlook, the survival of the man who first makes this daring flight. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. If we make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation, for all of us must work to put him there. How many of you know who that was? Say it out loud. Who was that? John F. Kennedy, one of your former presidents. For those who don't know, it was a great speech, wasn't it? How many of you remember that speech? Was anybody around back in the 60s? Oh, yeah. Some of y'all are raising that hand slow. It's that arthritis. But you were there. That was a big ask, wasn't it? was a big ask of a man who was our president to, to ask the nation to go to the moon. Kennedy asked Congress and the entire nation to do something that had never been done. He asked them to do something that seemed absolutely, at the time, absolutely impossible. To do something that would require technology and equipment and parts and fuel and all kinds of things that didn't even exist, that still had to be invented, and he asked them to do it before the decade was out. A big ask. What would you ask if you were the president? What, what would you ask of this nation if you had that pulpit, if you had that opportunity to come before the nation and ask for something? What would be your big ask? What would you ask if Elon Musk was your BFF? <laughs> Let's just say you and Elon are real tight, y'all went to school together, you've remained close, Elon comes to you one day as a lifelong bestie, and he says, what do you want? Anything in the world, all you have to do is ask, what would be your big ask? What would you ask God for today? If you could ask God for anything, what would it be? What, what would you ask Jesus for? What would you ask the Holy Spirit for this hour? Today, we're going to meet a man in Scripture who got that chance. He got the chance to ask Jesus for something. His story is recorded in three of the four Gospels. It's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, Luke, and Mark. We're going to read and study it from Mark's perspective. All three of the Gospels record it slightly differently when it comes to the details, but they're all strikingly similar. And they all center around the big ask. The big ask of a blind man named Bartimaeus. Let's turn in our text to Mark chapter 10 and start in verse 46, and we'll read through verse 52. We'll grab all the context of the story and then come back and look at it and see what we can learn from it. As you open there in your Bible, I pray that you will allow the Holy Spirit of God 
to encourage you this day through this text. Here's what it says in verse 46. They came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he warned him to keep quiet. But he was crying out all the more, Have mercy on me, son of David. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, Have courage. Get up. He's calling for you. He threw off his coat. He jumped up and he came to Jesus. And then Jesus answered him, What do you want me to do for you. Rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you. And immediately he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. We could spend our entire time here today and we could focus on the miracle that happens, but I sense we should focus on the man in the text instead. We could say much of the love and the compassion and the grace and the heart of our Messiah from this text. It would be a beautiful angle to explore this scripture from. But, but it is the man in this text, the, the blind man, Bartimaeus, that I believe is easiest for us to relate to and the one who offers us much to learn from this day. We can learn from this man who made his big ask of Jesus how we might do the same. Perhaps the biggest lesson of all today is found in our big idea for today, three simple words, something I repeat and say often. Many of you have probably heard me say it. Asking is free. Asking is free. Why not ask? It didn't cost him much to ask, did it? I mean, sure, it cost him a bit of his time. I guess it cost him a bit of his pride, I suppose. But when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Why not go ahead and ask? Asking's free. Jesus asks, and there are five things about what this man does that strike me. Five things I think we can learn from him through this text. The first one can be summed up with the word desire. This man had a desire inside of him. If you don't know what you want, then you're probably not going to get anything in life. If you have no desire, then that's probably what you're going to get, nothing. Abby asked me the other day, she said, what do you want for Christmas? You know what I said? I don't know not a very good answer, is it? I don't know. And, and I wasn't trying to be that husband that's hard to shop for. I wasn't trying to blow her off. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't trying to be difficult. The truth of the matter, though, is this. There's just really very little in this world I desire anymore. I, I truly, honestly, don't know what to ask for. I mean, I have a great wife, an amazing wife, a beautiful wife, a loving wife. I have four amazing kids that are growing up way too fast. It's my only complaint about them. I have a ministry I love. I mean, some people say it's my job. It doesn't feel like a job. I I love it. I love what I do. I've, I've got a roof over our family's head. We have food on our table anytime we want it. We have food in our fridge. Y'all, we have two freezers. Two freezers full of food. In the summertime, I have this thing in my house called an air conditioner. Oh, what a beautiful thing it is. And when it's hot outside, I can just come into that cool, refreshing air. And in the summer, I mean in the winter, when it gets cold, I can, I, I can just turn up the heat. I don't have to go chop wood or cut wood or build a fire. I I don't even have to get up and go push a button on my wall. I can literally pick up my phone from my couch 
and tap this little button on my phone and it just warms my house up. How spoiled am I? I have friends and family who love me and care about me. I just don't desire much of anything that's at the store or on a shelf anywhere. My desires are things you can't really buy, stuff you can't really give somebody. So it makes me a very hard person to shop for. I get it. But to be fair, Abby's the same way. I asked her what she wanted, and she was like, I don't know. Pretty much got everything I want. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think many of us get to that place in life, don't we? Like we come to this place in life where, where we just don't desire what's here as much as we used to. I mean, when we were younger, we did. My kids, they all have a Christmas list. You know, Tatum, my youngest, she brought me her Christmas list, I think in May. You know, she's like, got it all planned out for you, Dad. Just get me all this stuff. And I was the exact same way in my younger years. Like when you're younger, you desire the things of this world and you want the stuff of this world. But it's like as you get older and more mature, you realize that it really has nothing to offer you. So like many of you, I've, I've come to this place in my life where I just realize the world has very little to offer me. So my desires have shifted away from things that are material and physical to things that are eternal and spiritual. I love what Psalms 37.4 says. Psalms 37.4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Take delight in the Lord. That's the first step. And then he gives you your heart's desires. Delight in the Lord first. Can you testify about that? Have you, have you experienced the truth of that? Say amen if you have. Amen. amen. That, it's there. Delight in the Lord, and then you get the desires of your, your heart. In Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7, Jesus said this. He said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. He says, who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or in verse 10, he says, if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Asking is free. So why not ask? Now, we have to be seeking the Lord when we're making these asks. We're not asking a celestial Santa Claus to just fill our every desire and satisfy our every whim and be about all of our pleasure. God's not going to just give it to you because you asked for it. It has to line up with his word. It has to line up with his will. It has to be for his glory and for his fame. We're told in James chapter 4 that we can ask for, from God things in the wrong ways, and then we're certain not to get them. He says in James chapter 4 verse 3, he says, you ask and don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. It's not about God's glory or God's fame. It's not about God's will or God's word. It's about you and your pleasure, and that's why you don't get it. You know, asking is free, but you know what else is free? Saying no. I tell my kids that all the time. Asking is free. You might as well ask. Several months ago, one of my kids was asking for something, and I said no. They said, but you always say asking is free. And I say, yeah, and so is saying no. Saying no is free too. It's okay to ask, but, but we shouldn't view this, this openness and this willingness for God to let us come and make a big ask as, as our ticket to just get anything we want for ourselves. We should view it as a way to bring God honor and glory and fame. You remember the blind man in our text? He had a desire. He knew what he wanted. And so when Jesus was passing by... Look at what he says in verse 47. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That was his desire. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He knew what he wanted. He knew what he needed. 
And whether he knew it or not, receiving that request was going to glorify the Lord on that day. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That was his greatest desire. What's your desire today? What do you want the Lord to do for you? Asking is free. Why not ask? This man had more than a great desire. He also had a great determination. A great determination that went along with his desire. Having a a, a clarified desire is great. Knowing what your desire is in your heart is awesome, but but there's going to also have to be some determination in your heart too. As most of you know, And as most of you have probably experienced in life, your desire will only take you so far. Because no matter what your desire is, stuff will get in the way. Obstacles will pop up. There will be challenges you have to overcome. Things are going to always try to get in your way. Let me give you some examples. Make this easy to understand. If you desire to stay married for 50 years, to celebrate your 50th wedding anniversary with your spouse... If you desire that, that is a great desire. It's a wonderful desire. It's it's an amazing desire. But I can promise you at some point in those 50 years, it's going to also require some determination. Amen? There's going to be a hard spot in the road. There's going to be a tough season in life. There's going to come a place where the determination is going to have to be mixed in with the desire if you're going to make it to what you desire. If you desire to be debt-free, to achieve financial freedom, that's amazing. That's a wonderful desire, but without determination, it's not going to happen. The determination is going to also have to be there in order to make the desire a reality. I, I told the first service, we actually have a couple in our church that paid their house off this past week and are now completely debt-free. They owe nobody in this world anything. Praise God. (laughs) They're in their early 40s, and they're debt-free. And that desire started in their hearts about eight years ago, nine years ago, I don't know exactly when, a long time ago, and along the way, guess what they've had to have? A bunch of determination. It's great to have the desire, but you also also have the determination. If you feel a strong desire to read the Bible, to read through it from Genesis to Revelation, or read it every single day of your life, if you have a strong desire to witness to your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers and to be a witness for Christ wherever you go, it's wonderful. It's a great desire, but the desire alone will not make those things a reality. There will also have to be determination. You're going to need some determination to mix in with the desire to make it a reality. It reminds me of a time in college. We went over, we were, it was kind of like a game night thing. I don't know what we were playing that night, but we went over to some friend's house and on their kitchen table where we normally played our games, on this particular night, there was a puzzle. And this puzzle was laid out and these ladies, there were two ladies who lived here at this duplex And um, they had been working on this puzzle for a while. I don't know if it was a 500-piece or a 1,000-piece puzzle. But they had most of the edges and the corners done, but they hadn't really gotten much further than that. I, I, I asked one of the girls who lived there, as we were setting up a table in the living room to play cards or dominoes or whatever we were playing that night, I said, hey, how long have y'all been working on the puzzle? And she said, oh, a couple of months. We've been working on it pretty hard. She said, it's a really hard puzzle, but we are determined to finish it, she said. I said, man, that's good. I said, I looked at it again, and I, I, you know, I just kind of say things. I probably shouldn't. And I just said, you haven't gotten very far in a couple of months. I mean, these are friends, just having a conversation. That was probably one of those things I should have kept in my head, but I said it out loud. And, And the young lady... And her roommate kind of looked at me like, well, that's kind of rude to say. And, and then the other one, who I wasn't talking to, chimed up, and she said, well, on the front of the box, it says six to ten years to complete it. So we think we're making great progress. <laughs> I 
I took a deep breath and I thought, should I say this out loud or not? And I decided to go ahead and say it. I hated to be the one, but somebody had to inform them that that six to 10 years on the front of the box was not the expected amount of time to finish the puzzle, but the age of who the puzzle was designed for. I tell you, I did though admire their determination. Look at verse 48 in our text. Many warned him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more, have mercy on me, son of David. Have mercy on me, son of David. He cried out all the more. The people around this blind man told him, be quiet, shut up, you're making a scene. Stop. But his desire was matched by his determination. And he said, no, 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 you don't get it. Jesus doesn't pass this way all the time. We're near Jericho. I may never see him again. And his determination is what made him continue to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He was determined to get the attention of Jesus so he could express the desire of his heart. His desire was pure, but it was his determination that was persistent. Have mercy on me, son of David. Before Jesus even asked him the question, what do you want me to do for you? This man was determined to not let Jesus pass him by. Have mercy on me, son of David. We're told so much in the scripture about the importance of determination in the life of a believer. Joshua, for example, was told to be strong and courageous and to not be afraid or be discouraged. He would have to be determined to lead God's people. In Proverbs chapter four, we are encouraged to fix our eyes straight ahead and not to waver to the right or to the left. That takes determination. Paul tells the Philippians to forget what is behind them and to reach for and strain for and pursue the heavenly call of God in Philippians chapter three, determination. We're told in Luke 18, one, that we are to pray and never give up, determination. First Corinthians 1558 says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Determination. Church, I just want to remind you that this journey you're on, this journey I'm on, this journey we're on through this thing called life, this journey is on a narrow road that is rocky and bumpy and treacherous and tragic at times, and it's going to require some determination on your part. Don't be surprised when your desire alone won't do the trick, and you need some determination to go along with it. The writer of Hebrews said this in Hebrews 10, 31 through 36. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember the earlier days when you had been enlightened? You endured. You endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions. And at other times you were companions of those who were treated that way. For you sympathized with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confiscation of your possessions because you know that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. So don't throw away your confidence which has a great reward for you need endurance so that after you have done God's will you may receive what was promised. You need endurance. Church, our calling is one of endurance and determination, not just desire alone. We see another beautiful thing exemplified in the life of this blind man here in Mark 10. Yes, his desire was pure, his determination is persistent, but you know what else? His dependence is profound. 
His dependence on Jesus, his dependence on God here is profound. This blind man, I dare say, has a leg up on you. This blind man has a leg up on me. This blind man has a leg up on the majority, the most of us. This blind man is in a better posture, a better position than most of us. And you say, why would you say that? I mean, being blind is awful, absolutely. This would be an awful way to live. But it's precisely why he has a leg up on you and I. Because he is blind, because he cannot see, because he is a beggar on the side of the road, suffering under this great affliction, there is great clarity in his heart on his need for Jesus. He knew he couldn't fix his blindness. He knew a doctor couldn't fix it. He knew he couldn't just go get a pill to fix it and make it all better. He knew medicine wasn't going to fix it. He knew a vacation wasn't going to fix it. He knew the only person who could fix it was Jesus. And so his desire was to see, and his determination is what made him keep going when everybody else told him to be quiet, but, but it's his profound dependence on God that sets him apart in this text from everybody else in the crowd. In verse 49, it says, Jesus stopped and said, call him. And so they called the blind man and said to him, have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, he jumped up, he came to Jesus, and then Jesus answered him. And here's the question, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I mean, can you just imagine if you could have been there on the side of the road and watch this unpack, watch this unfold? Jesus tells this man, what do you want me to do for you? The smile that must have entered his face. I wonder if tears begin to flow out of his eyes in his blindness. And he says, Rabbi, I want to see I want to see. He didn't want money. He didn't want fame. He didn't want anybody to remember his name. He didn't want power. He didn't want a good looking wife. He didn't want to live to be 500 years old. He just says, I want to see. You're the only one who can do it. So when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? He just says, I want to see. Gosh. You see, he knew Jesus was his only hope. He knew Jesus was the only way he was going to be healed. He knew Jesus was the only one who could save him. Do you know that? Do you know Jesus is the only way, the only truth? the only life? Do you know he is the only one who can save you? You see, it's so easy for many of us, all of us, to be deceived into thinking that our good works are going to account for something, or that our generosity counts for something, or that our church attendance counts for something, or that our good reputation around town counts for something, or whatever else. It's easy for us to fall into the life that we live and go, you know what, that's going to be good enough. And we start putting our hope in that. We're just not as desperate as this man is. And so for us, we have to be quick to come back to our dependence on Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. No matter where you are in this life, no matter how good things are for you right now, we must always remember that we are all like this blind man totally, utterly, desperately dependent on God, on Jesus, and on the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to what Jesus said in John 15, 5, and then we'll move on. In John 15, 5, he says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do, and if you haven't already, you should circle or underline this next word, because you can do nothing without me. Nothing. Nothing. Anytime I start to think I can do something, I remind myself that I can do nothing. 
Anytime I start to think that I might be able to do something, I remind myself of the truth of this passage in this verse. There is nothing worthwhile, there is nothing of eternal significance that I can do without Jesus. This man was just fully dependent on Jesus, and we should be as well. Next, we see his amazing deliverance. He's healed. He's healed and he can see. He's delivered. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? He makes a big ask. He says, I want to see. Oh boy, I I want to see Jesus. And in this text, there's both a, a physical and a spiritual deliverance mentioned in verse 52. This man is healed from his blindness physically, but he's also healed from his sin spiritually. His spiritual blindness goes away as well, and he's saved. Verse 52 says this, Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you. Some of your translations may say, go, your faith has made you well. It's not an awful translation, but it's, it's, it's not a good translation of that word, because that, that phrase, your faith has made you well, makes, makes it sound like all that happened that day was his eyes were healed, but that's not a real fair and fully accurate translation in the Greek. The word that's used here is the word sozo, and it's a, it's a Greek verb that means to become well or to be healed. It can speak of a physical healing, but it's also used consistently over and over and over again throughout the New Testament to proclaim salvation, to proclaim a spiritual healing and a spiritual forgiveness that is brought to people as well. For example, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, talking about what Jesus is going to do before he's even here, it says, she will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save, that's the word, the verb, he will save his people from their sins, not he will make them well, it says he will save them, it's a spiritual thing. In Matthew 19, 25, there's another example. When the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Not who can be made well. This isn't a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. So they say, who can be saved? In Luke chapter 8, verse 12, we find another example. The seed along the path, this is Jesus speaking. The seed along the path are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved, not made well. That verb there is saved. It's a spiritual thing. There are at least 17 more examples that I know of where that that specific word is used to clearly point out spiritual salvation, not just a physical healing. He wasn't just made well. He was saved. There's actually another word in Greek that is most commonly used when indicating a physical healing only. It's the word we get our word therapeutics from. In Luke chapter 4 verse 40, we see that particular word used when it says this, when the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him, and as he laid his hands on each one of them, he healed them. That was a physical healing. That was them being made well. The word there in verse 40 denotes a physical healing only, not a spiritual one. Now, if you keep reading on in verse 41 here in Luke 4, we see that Jesus on this same very, very same occasion does perform spiritual healings. There are demons that are cast out and other spiritual things that happen. But here in in Luke chapter 4, those things are separated. But when Mark, in his text, in verse 52, says, Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you, he uses the language to signify that his eyes were healed physically, so he could see again, but he was also healed spiritually and forgiven and saved from his sins. That was a result of his pure desire, his persistent determination, and his profound dependence of faith in Christ, which brought him to this place of perfect and total and absolutely complete physical and spiritual deliverance. 
Now we could stop there because there's a lot to celebrate. We could just stop here and go, wow, this guy is healed. What a great thing that is for us. But, but let us not stop before we get to the end because there's another crucial and important point here. And it's our last one for today. It's the word discipleship. This man was not just delivered physically and spiritually, but he entered into discipleship with Jesus. It's so important because so many people in our day to day, they stop short of this. They stop short of discipleship. They have the desire. They perhaps have the determination to mix with the desire. They put their faith or their dependence in Christ. They're saved and are delivered. But then rather than following Jesus down the road, Far too many times we just go back off in our own direction. We go back to what we were doing before. We're just a slightly better version of who we used to be. Not this man. Look at the last part of 52. Immediately he could see physically he was healed and he began to follow Jesus on the road. He followed Jesus. He didn't go back to his mat church. He didn't go back and start begging again just with his eyes open so he could see who was putting a little coin in his cup. He didn't go back to Jericho. He followed Jesus. He entered into discipleship. There's a, this is just another clear indication that his deliverance was not just physical, but it was spiritual. His first and most natural desire after being healed physically and spiritually is to draw near to Jesus and to follow him. That desire for discipleship didn't come from him being able to see with his eyes. It came from him being able to see with his heart. The scales of deception had fallen away from him spiritually. And for the first time in his life, he's able to see clearly, both physically and spiritually. And he wants to be close to Jesus. There's a a passage in John chapter 12 where Jesus is having a very serious conversation. And as part of that conversation, he says this. He says, if anyone, verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Are you following Jesus right now? How close are you following? Are you on the road with him? Are you in the same place as he is? I think that's a good thing for us to consider this week. It's a real challenge, something worthy of our prayer and consideration. Where are we in that discipleship process? For those of us who have worked our way through the rest of it and been delivered, have we continued to follow him? We should not, church, just be satisfied with knowing we're saved. We should continue on with him in full discipleship and follow the Lord as best we can every single day. John F. Kennedy, in 1961, wanted us to go to the moon. As audacious and as ambitious as that was in the early 1960s, it cannot even compare to what God wants. Kennedy wanted us to go to the moon. God wants us to go to heaven. God wants you and I and everyone you know to be restored into a right relationship with him, just like this blind man was. He wants you to be saved. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 3, it says this, this is good and pleases God our Savior. Verse 4, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants everyone to be saved. But there's a problem The problem is sin, and we've all been infected with it. We've all been overcome by it, and we are all fallen and wretched and separated from God because of it. The distance between you and the moon right now is nothing compared to the distance between you and God if you're lost. The distance between you and heaven, if you sit here today lost in your sins, never have repented never have confessed, never have believed. That distance is a chasm you can't cross. 
It's infinite, that distance. That chasm is so deep and so wide, you will never be able to cross it. Let me put what I'm trying to say maybe another way, a simpler way. Let me just say it as plainly as I know how. You have a better chance of flying yourself to the moon under your own power by flapping your arms. No rocket, no spacecraft, no boosters, no fuel, just you doing this, flapping as hard as you can. You have a better chance of getting yourself to the moon under your own power by flapping your own arms than you do entering into the gates of heaven if you don't know Jesus. If you're lost this hour, I can tell you with full certainty and full confidence that you have a better chance of walking on the surface of the moon than you do the streets of gold and glory. Yes. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. But you got to look at verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. Church, there are many ways to get to the moon. There is only one way to come into the presence of God and to get to heaven, and that is through the man Christ Jesus who God himself gave as a ransom for your sins, a ransom for all, and a testimony at the proper time. If you are not saved, I pray you will repent. I pray you will confess. I pray you will believe this day like Bartimaeus. And I pray you will follow Jesus the rest of your life in discipleship. Let's pray. If you're here this hour and can hear my voice and you know if you died right now you would not enter into those gates of glory. You would not walk on those streets of gold. If you know precisely what I'm talking about when I describe the chasm between you and God being infinite and uncrossable the good news is you don't need a rocket ship to get to heaven. You don't need billions of dollars and an entire nation behind you. God sent one man to do the job. His name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life, the only name under heaven by which you can be saved. He will forgive you of your sins this very hour and heal you just as he did this blind man if you will repent, believe, and confess. If that's you, just say this. Say, Lord... It's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I have messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would cleanse me and make me new. I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, for dying for me. Father, as we close this hour, I pray that we would, Lord, that we would be a people, a church. Lord, that we would be families and men and women of God who understand that asking is free and that you want us to ask that even if it's a big ask, we should bring it to you. There is no bigger ask in all the world than that you would save us, and you have already done that. If you did not withhold your son and your salvation from us, Lord, what else would you? Lord, help us to be bold enough to ask. Lord, I pray that our desire and our determination wouldn't be selfish or worldly, but it would be a dependence on you that drives it. And that our deliverance would lead us to a place of discipleship 
not back to the mat where you found us. Lord, help us. Bless us, comfort us, encourage us, transform us. We ask and we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of our online family and joining us for this message that God put on my heart. I pray that it blesses you. I want to ask you if you could just do three quick, simple, easy, free things for me right away. If you haven't already, number one, hit the subscribe button. Number two, hit the thumbs up or like button if you feel like this video, this sermon is worthy of that. And number three, if God blesses your heart with this message, leave an encouraging word. Just leave an encouraging comment or a thought down there in the comment section. We would appreciate that so much. Thank you for being a part of our family, for joining us uh, here for this message.